Okay, colleagues, uh, we we're still we're still gossiping. We still have things we got to figure out. Uh, welcome. Good morning, everybody. This is my campaign to bring Bates Gill back to Washington, and we're going to uh, hold him hostage here. We're going to let him go until global warming turns Sweden into uh, a balmy tropical paradise. And so we'll plan on being with us for a bit, Bates. Welcome. We're glad to have you back, and we're glad to have this opportunity, of course, to partner with CIPRI. Um, I remember when 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 Mike uh, Green first talked to me about this project, and he said that it's, I, I mean, I you know I didn't understand it at the first time he talked to me, and during the last year I've been learning so much more about this. I think becoming one of the really most interesting pivotal structural questions that we're looking at. Uh, so I'm 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 very I'm proud to say that Mike and Bates were out in front uh, to get this going. You're going to see some very interesting information today. I think a product of this review. Uh, you know, forgive me for doing just a little bit of, of bragging, but we had a chance. I say we. I mean, Mike had a chance to uh, uh, to go over this material with the uh, Secretary of State, and it, she, she reviewed it all on her flight over and is in the middle of an, of an interesting trip. And I think that you'll see this as part of the landscape of this administration or any administration looking forward as we, as we say, what's going to be the structure of the internationalization in Asia? I mean, we've had such profoundly different approaches in Europe and in Asia to the demands of internationalization. And you, there's a real sense that it's becoming structural now in Asia. It's tr certainly, we're a long ways away from the patterns that have developed in, in Europe. Uh, it's, I've always found it ironic that in Europe, countries chose to dissolve their sovereignty in order to protect their nationality. And in Asia, people were, they, they were willing to dissolve their economies to do that. I mean, so in, in a way, we have two profoundly different approaches to the challenges of international integration in this era, and we're going to explore some of that today. So I, um, I want to say special thanks to Mike and to Bates for leading on what you're going to see is a very, very interesting project. And uh, as we said, we're going to give you the results of it on the way out the door because if we gave it to you now, you'd all be sitting here looking through the paper rather than listening. So we're glad that you're here. Thanks for coming. Let me turn it over to who? I don't know who's leading here. But Bates, I'll turn it to you. Thank you. Thank you very much, John. Um, thanks, one and all, for joining us this morning. It's good to see you all. Um, we began thinking, Mike and I, when, when I was working here at CSIS back in um, about 2006, uh, we began thinking about this uh, project and how uh, could we bring a little bit more substance and, 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 and uh, understanding uh, to what was already even then becoming a uh, very, very dynamic, uh, a sort of proliferating set of, of institutional approaches in the Asia Pacific. Uh, that resulted uh, thanks to a generous support uh, from uh, the MacArthur Foundation and from uh, the Stanley Foundation uh, in a uh, conference, which was organized in St. Michael's, Maryland, in the late latter part of 2006. Uh, many of you uh, were there at that discussion, and we were able to bring experts from all around uh, the world who are looking at the question of Asia-Pacific institutions and their evolution, uh, commissioning research from these individuals to, uh, to look in a rather structured way uh, at what we were some of the questions we wanted to have answers for, um, such as uh, uh, what sort of issues and uh, challenges need to be met uh, by this evolving institutionalism in the, in the region? Uh, which countries or members ought to be uh, taking part uh, in, in, these, in these mechanisms? And then um, what specifically would be done uh, what sort of mechanisms could be actually put in place to, to try and meet some of the challenges which we could envision over the horizon for the Asia Pacific. Um, that resulted in the publication eventually with the Columbia University Press of this book, uh, which is also available uh, following our discussions this afternoon, uh, this morning, called Cooperation Competition, I'm sorry, Asia's New Multilateralism, Cooperation Competition and the Search for Community, uh, which again is an excellent 
compendium of, of research by scholars and experts from across uh, the region. Um, from there, uh, we wanted to combine this somewhat more scholarly and uh, in-depth study uh, with a survey, uh, which would ask a series of questions professionally uh, organized uh, of what we were calling strategic elite in the Asia-Pacific region. Uh, we put together a, an advisory team of persons uh, here in the United States and from elsewhere in the Asia-Pacific region to help us uh, develop a list of some 150 persons uh, from nine countries in the Asia-Pacific region. Um, those being the United States, Australia, China, India, Indonesia, Singapore, Thailand, Japan, and Korea. Uh, and to, uh, from this list, uh, generate then, uh, through, through the uh, assistance of the Opinion Dynamics uh, Company, as well as with assistance from uh, Asai Shinbun and the Jong-An Ilbu Shinbun in, uh, in Korea, uh, to then carry out surveys in the native languages of, of these countries uh, to ask them questions about this emergent multilateralism, emergent institution building uh, in the region. Mike's going to go through in a moment the uh, specific results of, of this uh, survey. Uh, just in terms of uh, methodology, uh, these were carried out by telephone, as I said, uh, in the um, native languages uh, of the countries. Uh, it was the, 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 the survey itself was developed again uh, in cooperation with uh, Bill Watts, uh, who unfortunately couldn't be with us uh, today, uh, and, and also in cooperation with Opinion uh, Dynamics and with our uh, advisory uh, group to come up with a relatively lengthy survey. Uh, I think it took between 15 to 20 minutes uh, to carry out, uh, but asking a range of questions about uh, emergent power uh, relationships in the region uh, going forward, uh, the, the role of institutions both domestically and regionally within the Asia Pacific, what are the biggest challenges uh, which these strategic elites see coming over the horizon uh, over the next 10-year uh, period, and which mechanisms, both existing or potential, might be well positioned to try and meet and deal with the challenges which they identified. Um, as a result, I think we were able to generate a great deal of quite interesting data and information, at least how some of these so-called strategic elites think about these questions in the future. Before uh, wrapping up this very, very brief introduction about the uh, background and methodology, I do want to thank once again uh, Bill Watts, uh, the members of our expert steering group, and of course the MacArthur Foundation, and the excellent cooperation and support we also received from the Asahi Shinbun and the Jong-An Ilbo Shinbun and the Opinion uh, Dynamics Corporation. So without any further ado about the background, let me turn the floor over to Mike to deliver the results of the findings and our recommendations. Um, <clears throat> thank you. Uh, it was a real pleasure uh, doing this project with Bates uh, and with our um, uh, expert steering group uh, who helped us um, define the um, experts in each country we would survey. Um, elite surveys like this are, are different uh, than the kinds of surveys you probably got used to during the presidential election that came out you know, every three hours with a margin of error and uh, sampling of several thousand. When you do mass public surveys like that, um, it's fairly easy to control for variables and to say with some precision, you know, how many percentage points off uh, from, from national opinion that survey sample would be. Um, this is a much more complicated process because we were uh, introducing subjectivity when we defined who is elite and who is strategic. And we tried to pick people um, in these nine countries who were involved and influential on the questions of regional um, foreign policy, economics, security, um, and, um, and we went over that list again and again. We had about a dozen people helping us, uh, and everyone opened their Rolodexes, and we ended up with over 300 um, respondents across the region. Um, but 
uh, uh, we didn't have exactly the same number in every country. So when I show you these uh, survey results, what you'll see is uh, a, a term where we said we have an, a weighted average. So if we had 75 Japanese strategic thinkers responding, but 40 in Korea or something like that, we tried to average out, give equal weight to each country. So that the reason we wanted to do this is, is so that we could identify those countries that were outliers. If, if China or the U.S. had a particularly uh, unique view on disaster response or so forth, we wanted to be able to compare that to the regional average. So we, we use that term weighted average. Um, we designed this survey like the book in a kind of a matrix so that we were looking at uh, challenges, then we were looking uh, down the other axis at the um, institutions people thought would work, um, and then in a way a third axis uh, uh, which is um, how each country's um, opinion lines up. So it's, it's very dense. There's a lot of data. We're just going to give you the parts that struck us as most uh, interesting and important right now. Um, We'll give you uh, uh, copies on the way out, uh, hard copies of the results. And then on our website, on the CSIS website, we'll have all of the responses. All, not they're, uh, they're anonymous, but we'll have all the data. And we'll also have uh, uh, many, many pages of comments, because people had the option in the survey to comment on specifically what they thought of you know, Bates Gill. Uh, um, and uh, we haven't redacted any of that. It's all there for you to see. Um, and uh, before Bates takes us to court, I, you know, you might want to look today because it's pretty juicy stuff. Um, but, you know, what they thought of the U.S. role, what they thought of the um, ARF or APEC or other institutions. It's, it's uh, something we think will be um, useful for uh, scholars and analysts looking at specific issues. If you're interested in views of human rights, you get a pretty nice cross-section of how elites uh, in the region view that. Um, so that's there for you to, to make use of, and I think it's on the website today, Kyoto? Yeah. Okay. Um, uh, let's go through what we found as some of the more, um, from our perspective, more uh, interesting findings. Um, and Kyoto Tsuji, who is one of our co-authors uh, in this effort, will um, navigate the slides. So the first um, finding one um, was a, a very pronounced expectation across the region that China is going to be more powerful than the United States in 10 years. Most of the questions asked in 10 years. Uh, we were asking 10 years into the future. And you'll see here that a weighted average across the region of 65.5% of the respondents said that China would be the most powerful country in Asia. Uh, the U.S. came in second with 31%, and Japan was a very distant third. Um, from my uh, look at popular opinion polls, Chicago Council and so forth, um, uh, it appears that elites have a much more... Um, pronounced expectation that China is going to be uh, the most powerful country in Asia in 10 years than the general public. Um, and this, by the way, was pretty consistent across the region. Um, so um, that was the first striking finding. Um, when we asked, however, what country would be the greatest force for peace and stability, as you can see, um, the U.S. Uh, did extremely well um, compared with China, and particularly and not surprisingly, among U.S. allies, Japan, Korea, and Australia, uh, uh, and key partners like Singapore, um, the U.S. Um, was uh, by a much larger margin uh, than China seen as a significant force for uh, peace and security. Um, one striking thing I'll come back to is that um, uh, the most negative view of the U.S. was in Thailand. And we pretty much consistently found that. And one of our conclusions and recommendations will be that we need some, uh, some work on Thailand. Um, when we asked uh, what country would be the greatest threat to peace and stability in the region, we saw the mirror image of the question on who's the greatest force for peace, and that is that across the region, uh, in every country, China was seen as the most, um, the greatest potential threat to peace and security in Asia in 10 years. Um, the, um, uh, the Chinese came in um, with 38 uh, percent. Uh, North Korea was second as a threat with 21 percent. Interestingly, in Korea, China uh, far outweighed uh, North Korea as a potential threat in 10 years. And not a single Korean respondent mentioned Japan, which uh, was striking. And there may be methodological reasons why this happened, but it was striking. Um, the U.S. happily is still feared, uh, and we came in third with 12.9 uh, percent. Um, again, the country most worried about the U.S was Thailand, um, which jumped out at us. The second major finding uh, 
we found, and this is not going to be surprising for those of you who travel in the region, is there is very broad support in all of these countries for the idea of developing an East Asia community. Now, we had a little bit of a methodological challenge here because the word East Asia community has been used by the ASEAN countries and the East Asia Summit. Uh, Kevin Rudd uh, of Australia uses Asia Pacific community. Um, the U.S. in the past has used that. So the words may um, skew this one way or the other. We thought if we used the somewhat, somewhat narrower definition of East Asia community, we would find perhaps somewhat less support. But in fact, 81% um, a weighted average of 81% across the region said that building an East Asia community was either very important or important. Um, and uh, while um, the U.S. respondents were a bit lower than the weighted average, the U.S. wasn't that far out of the mainstream. Um, interestingly, the country where elites were the most enthusiastic was India. Um, uh, and, uh, and, and we'll come back to this later, but we asked later on what country should be in the East Asia community. India didn't fare that well <laughs> in the views of uh, narrowly defined East Asia. Um, and maybe that explains the Indian elite's enthusiasm uh, for uh, championing this idea. Um, now, that is the broad idea of an East Asia community. We started then asking more detailed questions about what this community should do, what the norms should be, the kinds of issues we got into in our book and our conference um, to see if we could make some uh, comparisons across the region. Um, and um, we included um, uh, the um, – uh, Kyoto, do you have the slide with the rank order of importance? You do not. Okay. I'll just mention this one. Um, when we, uh, we asked across the region what are the, um, what are the issues, what, what should this East Asia community do? Um, the, the rank order, I'm going to have to read this to you. You can see it later. Um, we had approximately 15 um, challenges or issues or opportunities that this East Asia community could challenge. Number one, not surprising, was promoting confidence and mutual understanding. A weighted average of 95% in all these countries said that. Number two was preventing interstate conflict, again with 95%, not surprising. Number three, um, Ellen will not be surprised, was uh, establishing a framework for trade and economic integration. 90% uh, said this was um, uh, very important or important. Then it started getting interesting because number four, and this is a weighted average across the region, including China, including um, uh, Southeast Asia and all of the countries we surveyed, number four was promoting good governance uh, with 85%. Um, number five was promoting human rights with 85%. Um, with excuse me, 80%. And uh, next was promoting open and free elections. Uh, now, we were asking in 10 years. And then you get down and the numbers start dropping as you look at um, defense, uh, uh, energy, regional identity, and some of the other things that are discussed as the ingredients of an East Asia community. Um, this really jumped out at us. And we, when, you, when we opened up the China uh, respondents, uh, what we found was that over 50% of the Chinese respondents, now these are elites, in think tanks like Kicker, the Shanghai Institute, uh, Fudan. But over 50 percent said that in 10 years the East Asia community should champion uh, good governance, human rights, and free and fair elections. Um, uh, this, was, um, this was really quite striking. Uh, now the caveat, because we also asked about the principle of interference in internal affairs or, or non-interference in internal affairs. And, and this is classically portrayed or often portrayed as a, a battle of ideas between the Beijing consensus of non-interference in internal affairs and then the Washington consensus, consensus of interference in internal affairs. And it, it does not break down neatly at all. Uh, it's quite complex, but I think um, uh, quite an opportunity, frankly, for, for the United States. Um, when we asked about the internal, uh, how important is maintaining the principle of internal non-interference in internal affairs? And of course, if you know the ASEAN Charter, both of these are enshrined in it, democracy, human rights, and non and, and, and. So not surprisingly, in some ways, India, uh, Indonesia, um, Thailand, uh, all the ASEAN countries and India, Singapore and China, um, it, it, developing or, if, if I may use the phrase, authoritarian countries, uh, whether democracies or not, all of them, all of the developing countries put a very high ranking on average 75 percent across the region um, and higher for them, uh, excuse me, uh, 75 percent for these developing countries, uh, uh, excluding the, the U.S., Korea, Japan, Australia, and so forth, 75 percent 
on average said non-interference in internal affairs as a principle should be continued. So when you look at India or you look at Indonesia or you look at Thailand and you open it up, um, 85, 90 percent say human rights, democracy, good governance in 10 years, and then about 75 percent say, ah, but continue the non-interference in internal affairs principle. So it does not break down neatly into a kind of democracies versus non-democracies. It's much more linked, we thought, to the level of development uh, within that country, the level of economic development. And, uh, and, and you might also argue the extent to which the country is a post-colonial state or not. Um, what does this mean? Well, we'll come back to this, but, but what you basically have is a very, very broad and we thought quite deep support for working over time on good governance, human rights, and rule of law and so forth, but, um, but a real caution about interference in internal affairs. Um, a couple of the other issues that were um, in the mix in terms of the uh, purpose of the East Asia community, um, the U.S. was an outlier on one uh, with Australia, which was um, uh, building, um, uh, 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 promoting defense and security cooperation. You all are familiar with the uh, former Pacific commander's thousand ship Navy idea. Uh, we're big on this. We're big on sharing the burden, cooperative engagement. Um, the rest of the region is not quite as enthusiastic about this aspect. It, it, it struck us. We shouldn't give up, but it does show that um, we have work to do convincing elites that a broad Asian capacity for, um, uh, for, for responding to various uh, defense needs, whether it's humanitarian relief or uh, 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 humanitarian relief, uh, ev evacuation, uh, and those kinds of exercises, that we're sort of way ahead of the rest of the region in our ambition. Um, you know, in the response to the tsunami, we therefore had to lead and go first, and the rest of the region plugged in. But I think that's the survey shows why that is. And, and again, we're asking 10 years into the future, so it may be that the U.S. is going to have to lead on this uh, for some time. Michael Hanlon did a great essay in our book on whether multilateral cooperation in Asia could lead to more regional capacity building for these kind of defense requirements. And he laid out what would be required, and I think what would be useful. I think the survey shows it's going to be. Uh, it's going to take U.S. leadership, and it's going to be a harder slog than we might want. Um, the U.S., as you can see on average, well, it's okay, but U.S. is 88 percent saying this is a capacity we need compared to a regional average of 75 percent. Um, another question or another issue was, uh, you know, whether the East Asia community should look more like the EU in promoting common diplomatic practices. Um, again, for those of you who travel in the region, this won't be surprising. But um, what we found was uh, smaller countries, and especially countries in ASEAN, were in favor of moving towards common diplomatic practices um, in general compared with the big countries, uh, and especially the Northeast Asian countries, Japan, Korea, China, but also Australia, U.S., India, uh, where there was much more skepticism that common diplomatic policies could be developed in multilateral uh, uh, institutions in Asia. Um, bottom line is that um, um, uh, most of the big powers uh, appear very happy to go along with the ASEAN Regional Forum and so forth, but are fundamentally realist in their assessments of their security needs and don't have um, a great faith that Asia, with its, with its diverse political systems and security threat perception, can develop common diplomatic practices. We, we, we bore in on this question and uh, wanted to know more about what elites thought were the right institutional tools to deal with certain challenges so that we could compare how important they thought um, uh, in 10 years, again, how important they thought regional institution building would be to actually solving problems as opposed to just building confidence uh, and talking together. Um, and what we generally found was that there was far higher confidence across the region in national tools and, in, and, and, and this was important. Uh, in global institutions, WTO, IMF, UN, far more uh, confidence in, in countries' national capabilities or in global institutions than there was in regional institutions. And again, we're asking in 10 years, so that's giving a good um, amount of time for the ASEAN Charter to be put into effect, for the ARF or EAS to start developing real institutional meat. Uh, but in general, um, we found uh, uh, that, the, that, the, that the nation state came first and then global institutions came second, and then a distant third was um, the burgeoning regional multilateral institutional network. We asked, for example, about preventing an attack on your country. And although 95 percent of the elites said that an important purpose of the East Asia community is to prevent attack 
and to prevent war, when you started asking how and who you, the old, what we call the ghostbuster question, who you're going to call, uh, nobody's going to call the EAS or the ASEAN Regional Forum or even ASEAN uh, when the um, situation goes kinetic, so to speak. Um, so, um, you know, as you can see uh, in this, uh, in this chart, uh, it's a bit easier to pull apart when you look at the book, but um, uh, the narrow lines represent individual countries. But you can see pretty clearly that on the question of how you're going to prevent an attack on your country, um, national military capabilities followed by bilateral alliances, uh, followed by the UN, and then ARF, the ASEAN Regional Forum, comes in third. So um, not a whole lot of faith in regional institutions. In Southeast Asia, you find a, you know, the reason that ARF and, and uh, ASEAN are a little bit higher is because the Southeast Asian countries put a bit more faith in those institutions than do the big powers in Northeast Asia. Interestingly, when you look at the numbers and you start picking apart our allies, uh, both Japan and Korea put a higher emphasis on alliances, i.e. the U.S., than their own national military capabilities. And again, 10 years from now. Um, so uh, pretty heavy burden for Uncle Sam into the future uh, uh, in terms of what the expectation is of us uh, to dissuade and deter attack. We asked about handling health pandemics. One of our initial findings in the book was that cooperation on things like SARS and avian influenza was really a great way to build institutional capacity because these things are transnational. Uh, an outbreak in Guangzhou can spread into Hong Kong and get to Vietnam. And if you don't have, uh, if you're not willing to cede some sovereignty and information to build a multilateral effort, you, you lose. So we thought it was a, you know, one of our findings in the book was that this is a really important area for building institutional cooperation. But when we asked um, the experts, uh, again, um, look at the, that's the WHO on the far left, the World Health Organization. Um, uh, um, and uh, uh, followed by um, national capabilities, ad hoc arrangements, um, uh, the UN, and then you start getting to regional organizations. Now, APEC, ARF, ASEAN all have agreements on fighting pandemic crises that are much trumpeted in the region as examples of how important these institutions are, uh, ASEAN and the ARF. But when you actually uh, do the ghostbuster question, who are you going to call, uh, people are looking still at national capabilities, ad hoc arrangements like the U.S. has did during SARS and avian influenza, and the U.N. The U.N. comes out of our survey pretty well, actually, and the World Health Organization. Uh, terrorism, uh, I won't go through the numbers, but a similar kind of result. Again, terrorism is an important area where, um, uh, where APEC, where um, ASEAN are, are developing um, uh, information sharing and so forth. But at the end of the day, um, it is... Um, a la carte compared to national capabilities, alliances, and again, interestingly, the UN. Um, so one of the themes that came, ran throughout this uh, with us was, you know, there's much talk about decoupling uh, in terms of fin the financial system or decoupling in terms of diplomacy. We didn't see it. Um, and we didn't see it broadly, and we didn't see it when we probed into Chinese or, or, or individual countries. What we saw was a real hope that global institutions will work um, uh, and expectation that the U.S. and alliances and national capabilities will be key and, you know, an interest in working on regional institutions, but really they were not, um, not so important in the eyes of these elites that there's a danger that somehow we're going to have a different system uh, developing in Asia on these. And there are more reasons why that will come to. Now, there were some areas uh, of good governance, just briefly. Um, this shows how complicated this is because when we asked what regional institutions can work on strengthening good governance in Asia, <laughs> That big blob at the end is none. Um, so um, for those of us who care about these issues, um, uh, uh, we're going to have to uh, think about um, uh, ad hoc and subtle and creative ways to tap into the deep support for uh, good governance, uh, uh, human rights, and even democracy in Asia um, and recognize that there's not a whole lot of appetite or expectation you can do these through the regional institutions or anything other than a kind of uh, – case-by-case case effort. Um, uh, there was some more interest on three areas. One was responding to regional uh, economic and financial crises. Um, again, after the 97-98 financial crisis, where there was a great uh, uh, reaction in the region against the Washington Consensus and the IMF orthodoxy, you might expect in Asia that when asking about how to respond to financial crises, the regional institutions would do well. But as you can see, the IMF uh, fares quite well. Um, uh, ASEAN does all right, uh, but that's mostly ASEAN members. 
um, U.S. and so forth. But there was uh, more expectation on financial issues that there could be a regional solution. And we did the survey September, October, early November. So the financial crisis was hitting. Um, it hit Korea first. Um, uh, uh, but it was in, I think, these elites' minds that there was a major problem with the international financial system. Um, but, but it's not reflected in the survey in terms of a rejection of the IMF or a rejection of uh, a global approach. But there was definitely an appetite that you didn't see on other issues for regional solutions. Not surprising, around the time we were doing the survey, Korea and Japan agreed on $30 billion in debt swaps, and the uh, Chiang Mai Initiative was doing some interesting things. But our take on this was, it was it's a supplement in the view of elites in the region, not a replacement for the IMF and global institutions. Uh, some appetite for economic uh, integration and trade liberalization. When I'm done, I'm going to ask Amy Seawright, who wrote the chapter on this for our book and helped us with the survey, maybe to say a bit more um, about that. Um, one thing that's striking is APEC, which is pretty important to us because it's trans-Pacific trade and liberalization, uh, didn't, didn't, didn't do great. Um, uh, striking how important bilateral FTAs are. I'm having trouble seeing the color, but I think that really high number is Korea. <laughs> um, and for the Korean elite across the board, U.S.-Korea FTA, that is the key to promoting a, a better region-wide economic and trade integration. Um, uh, USTR designate uh, take note. <laughs> um, uh, it, it's, 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 it's viewed as very important. Uh, proliferation, nuclear proliferation, there was also um, some more support for regional approach. I think this reflected the six-party talks uh, and, uh, and a fair, a healthy uh, support for six-party talks among all the powers involved. We didn't survey Russia or North Korea, but the four we did, except, interestingly, Japan. And when we asked the Japanese, we had 74 Japanese respondents from various think tanks and so forth. Um, the, when we asked what institution is best prepared to handle proliferation in Asia, we had a list of options, and we, as a throwaway, we threw in PSI, the Proliferation Security Initiative, um, which is an initiative to interdict transfers of WMD and WMD-related technology. Uh, well, in Japan, that came in, came in first place. PSI interdiction is the number one way to deal with proliferation. It beat out the six-party talks by a considerable margin, whereas the U.S., Japan, and Korea had, um, had more faith in the six-party talks. Um, so you can see that on the institutions and the themes, there's an awful lot of disagreement across the region on how best to do things still. Uh, some broad agreement on what to do, but a lot of disagreement on how to do it and where to place it in terms of institutions. And in general, a lot more faith in global institutions, bilateral alliances, and national capabilities. One, the last finding is um, that, um, uh, and we expected this, there's not a whole lot of consensus on who should be in an East Asia community. Uh, this is not the European Union uh, whole and free, uh, you know, democracies more or less from Portugal to, uh, uh, well, how far east you want to go depends on your political perspective, but Georgia, shall we say. But anyway, um, uh, this is Asia, vastly different political systems and um, different threat perceptions. So we asked who's, who's going to be in, who ought to be in. Um, we asked about India, uh, the U.S., Australia, New Zealand, and the EU as sort of the outliers that would like to somehow be involved. And I'm, do you have the pie charts for this one? No? Um, uh, in, the, in, the, in, the, in the book and online, we have this in bar, ch bar charts, but also pie charts, which are a little bit easier in some ways. Um, asked about India. <clears throat> um, uh, uh, well, India was the most enthusiastic, 68%. Um, uh, uh, if I'm reading that right, 68% said it wasn't too important for India to be in uh, and uh, on a weighted average. Now, uh, in these polls, you are not allowed to mention your own country, so this does not include Indian votes. <laughs> um, uh, so India scored fairly low. The most enthusiastic about India were Japan and Singapore. Um, we asked about the U.S. The U.S. did the best of the, outs the so-called outside powers. 61% said the U.S. needs to be in the East Asia community. Um, uh, I believe, correct me if I'm wrong, Kyoto, that in every country, majority said the U.S. had to be in, including China. Um, uh, Australia did pretty well, but not as well as the U.S. Sorry, guys. 47% <laughs> uh, um, said it was important for um, Australia to be in the East Asia community. Um, so uh, New Zealand did worse than Australia. 
So there's small consolation for our Australian friends. Um, uh, but a lot of people said they didn't know. And, um, and the other thing that's quite clear from the earlier graphs is we're not talking, although we talk about an East Asia community, we're talking about a lot of different institutions. None of these powers are putting their faith in any one institution. So there's plenty of room for all of us, including India, uh, to play. Uh, because we're not talking in all likelihood about an EU. Um, we, we had um, some broad recommendations, and I'll just briefly touch on them because you all can look at this, come to your own conclusions. Um, but briefly, Bates and I and our, and our, and our group, um, this is uh, by me, Bates, Kyoto, and, and, and Bill Watts, so the other members of our expert group are not um, implicated in our recommendations. They helped us analyze, and we came to these conclusions and recommendations ourselves. But uh, one is we thought, you know, uh, the U.S. should support, this is for U.S. policy, should support the idea of an East Asia community. Um, and it's probably a mistake for us to hyperventilate and say, don't do it, don't exclude us, because it's pretty clear that the it is still being defined and there's broad support for us being in it. The more important thing is that we, we, we engage and we're involved in the process. And it's not helpful, in our view, to have a debate coming out of Washington about whether or not this is a good thing. Uh, it is, it's, and it's not as threatening as some people think. Uh, we, we thought, given the high um, numbers in Japan and Korea, and to some extent Australia, about how critical the U.S. is in every aspect, we thought it important that this process be very much centered on our allies uh, for reassurance, but also because we, we, in the polls, you will see, share, share, share views on this very closely. And Secretary Clinton stopping first in Japan is a good sign that that's the way things will go. Um, we felt quite confident. Um, working uh, or recommending a close cooperative working relationship with China. Now, this is the elite, and they're more internationalist. We didn't survey the PLA. Uh, we, we scooped up a few former PLA generals, but uh, there may be different views on this. But in general, among the elites we surveyed in China, there was a pretty healthy view about the and positive view about the U.S. participation in this. And rather than seeing this process as a way for China to exclude the U.S., we think it's probably a good area for cooperation. There will be things like the Shanghai Cooperation Organization where China is gaming the system uh, and, 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 and seeking leverage uh, with the U.S. not there. But as a general uh, issue, we thought room for cooperation with China. Um, energy struck us as a very uh, – I didn't put that slide up – but in energy, there was a very high degree of expectation across the region that in 10 years you could start building some real institutional cooperation. I don't know if um, Bob Manning's here, but Ma Bob Manning and others have talked about Asia Atom, a nuclear cooperative forum. Um, uh, so there's room there. Um, we're going to have to do, I think the U.S. is going to have to take the lead in building broader military to military cooperation on a multilateral level. It seems like we recognize it as most important. Um, we tend to bring the more substantive initiatives like the tsunami relief on the table. We ought to try to find ways to get others to help, but I think that is going to be up to us. Um, uh, the global institutions, UN, WHO, uh, pretty important in the, in, in, uh, uh, in, the, in, the, uh, in the eyes of regional elites. And so we ought to be thinking also about how to connect the regional agenda um, more to the, um, to the UN institutions that work. And one that stood out was WHO, uh, for example. Um, and finally, we uh, – sorry, uh, three more. Uh, you know, we see a lot of room for, for working good governance – human rights and democracy into our agenda. It should not fall off of the U.S. foreign policy priority list because it's very high on the region's priority list. And the question is, how do you organize it with allies, with friends, with like-minded states to continue to take advantage of that? Um, one idea would be to focus first on good governance, where there's very broad support in the region. Um, another would be to get on issues that are a bit more sensitive, like, uh, like uh, hum uh, elections or human rights, to, to work with uh, friends and allies, perhaps Korea or Japan, um, so that um, uh, it, it has that more of a regional uh, dimension. Uh, the threat perception is question, who's the greatest challenge? Japan came in sixth among regional elites. Um, for better or worse, our conclusion was that regional elites are not afraid of Japan <laughs> uh, the way perhaps a lot of commentators in this town think they are. Um, and uh, the other aspect of that was, though, um, fairly low expectation about Japan's power in the region. Um, and then the third dimension is very close alignment between the U.S. and Japan on a lot of these key issues. Um, so we think that this, um, you know, really um, – should give encouragement to friends in Tokyo to be, to be pushing uh, 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 more of a security role. 
Um, you know, we're not pushed. We didn't say anything concrete about the Constitution or collective defense or Afghan deployment. But as a general rule among the elite, there's a lot of room for Japan to grow its role um, and in many ways a need for it. Uh, and then last but not least, boy, we're doing really badly in Thailand. Um, and uh, we have a lot of work to do. Um, on the substantive issues like, uh, like, like democracy and human rights, and we're, we're not far off from where the Thai are in many ways. But on the Thai view of the US, we're, we're doing really pretty badly, at least among the elites we surveyed. So those were our main findings and conclusions. I want to end here. Um, if it's OK, I wanted to um, ask Matt Stumpf from MacArthur to say something. That MacArthur funded this, I think it was the first uh, project in their new Asia initiative and sort of is a, uh, a bit of a pathfinder. And then maybe a Amy, and then we'll, we'll open it up. So Matthew, do we have a microphone? Thanks. Uh, as you may know, the MacArthur Foundation recently began a seven-year, $68 million grant-making initiative on Asian security issues. And as uh, Mike points out, this grant was um, one of the handful of an, an initial grants that we made to help better understand the range of Asian security issues and also understand the work underway in the region. Um, indeed, we've been fortunate to have the advice of, of Mike and, and Bates and now the benefits of the results of this project. Um, it's fitting that this report is the first uh, product of the Age of Security Initiative because I expect that the results that were discussed today will help uh, guide us towards subject areas of particular interest and opportunity um, as we work towards the goal of the initiative, which is to increase the effectiveness of, of international cooperation and fostering peace and security in the Asia Pacific. Uh, in our first round of, of grants, which we're just announcing now, we've made grants around three clusters of issues. Um, the first on regional security cooperation, um, how we can better use multilateral institutions, bilateral relationships and alliances to prevent conflict, manage differences, and foster peace and security in the region. A second cluster on Northeast Asian security challenges, and the third on internal security challenges that by their nature require international cooperation. We'll also be uh, starting a fellowship program for mid-career um, people from government, academic world, think tanks, NGOs, the media, and business to spend a year working together on Asian security challenges. And also a web portal that'll bring together the products of this initiative, including the first one here today, uh, that we'll announce in, um, or that we'll roll out in May. It'll be asiasecurity.macfound.org. So with that, I just wanted to congratulate you for the first Asia Security Initiative um, project, and um, thank you. Thanks, Matt. It was a really, um, uh, in addition to getting the, uh, the budgetary support, it was really important for me and for Bill Bates and our group to work with Matt and Amy Gordon and others uh, at MacArthur to build, build the survey so that it helped um, also um, do some pathfinding for subsequent research. We see this in some ways as the beginning of a debate. Um, and uh, is it 68 million? Is it, I mean, for, for those of us in the Asia world, it's been a long time since the major US foundations have put that kind of money in. And Matt will have his checkbook and we'll be outside afterwards um, for, for those of you interested. And Amy, uh, Amy uh, wrote our chapter in the book on uh, trade and finance. And, I, and since neither of us are economic, economists, we thought maybe Amy could uh, upfront uh, or if, um, microphone could add one or two comments on the trade and finance findings. Um, sure. Um, do you have the charts for figure 13 and, um, and then 12 after that? Yeah, let me just add a couple of points about trade and finance. Mike had asked me to look at the numbers uh, that came in from the survey of elites. And um, first of all, I was happy to see that the results basically confirmed what I found in my chapter when I looked in detail at the emerging FTA network and other regional mechanisms to promote trade cooperation. And on the finance side, look at the Chiang Mai Initiative and other regional mechanisms on financial cooperation and found, as Mike said, to my surprise, frankly, I found that the region was not decoupling, in his words, that the region was not really moving down a path of regionalism that would uh, imply sort of de detaching itself from global regimes. But in fact, the, the mechanisms that were being created were very much nested to a large degree in, in global economic regimes. And the numbers here, uh, to a large degree, back this up. But the, they're very interesting to look in detail. Um, 
many of us hear sort of a consistent tune or melody coming out of the region. And when you look at the numbers, you find that actually there are a lot of different notes in play and some surprises. It's much more polyphonic than, than you might imagine. Um, so on the trade front, um, uh, could you go to the next one on the trade first? Uh, thank you. Um, you know, as, as Mike said, in some ways it's, it's not surprising. The overall impression you get when you look at these numbers is that bilateral FTAs are the most important mechanism that elites see for promoting trade cooperation. But somewhat surprising, so, so in general you see that bilateral FTAs are more important than regional mechanisms like ASEAN plus three and ASEAN plus six and other formulations. And the WTO, to some degree, lags at the bottom toward, towards the back, although there's a lot of variation in here and some surprises with the WTO, one of which is that India uh, strongly prefers the WTO to any other mechanisms. And another surprise is that Japan ranks the WTO very low um, relative to its other preferences. Um, but on the regional front, APEC, as Mike said, does not rank highly, which is not surprising. However, at the same time, APEC does not rank as low as many of us might have thought, given what we often hear coming from the region. And when you look at the countries in particular, some more surprises emerge. For example, two of the three ASEAN country elites that were surveyed, namely Thailand and Indonesia, rank APEC more highly or as highly as WT other regional mechanisms and the WTO and bilateral FTAs. So here's another Thailand puzzle for you. Thailand prefers APEC to any other mechanism, which is especially surprising given, given its other feelings about the United States. So maybe what we should do with Thailand is engage them in APEC. Um, so it does look like there's a little bit more life left in APEC than some um, tend to think. And perhaps using APEC to manage the emerging bilateral FTAs, which of course is a priority for the United States and many other countries in APEC, uh, using APEC to kind of deal with these, this emerging FTA network, uh, manage, coordinate, perhaps harmonize the FTAs, uh, may be a fruitful agenda. And then on the, on the financial side, um, uh, responding to crises, here, staying on APEC for a moment, I think it's no surprise to see that APEC ranks very low, given Asia's experience with the Asian financial crisis a decade ago. However, perhaps somewhat surprisingly, Chiang Mai Initiative also ranks pretty low. Chiang Mai Initiative, of course, was created in the wake of the Asian financial crisis to a large degree to um, deal with the failures, the perceived failures of APEC and the IMF and other institutions to deal with the regional crisis. But Chiang Mai Initiative, uh, to those of us who have looked at it closely, it's actually not that surprising that, frankly, it's not that relevant or effective to deal with the current economic crisis. And countries in the region, for the most part, recognize that, although Japan is relatively supportive which is unsurprising given that Japan is, is a leader of the Chiang Mai Initiative. But as Mike said, what, what it really leaps out here is the resurgence, so to speak, of the IMF. There's a lot of confidence in the region for the IMF, as well as, uh, to some degree, the World Bank. But the IMF we see emerging in this financial crisis as, um, as a real center of attention. It's been the center of attention in G20 discussions about um, responding to the crisis, uh, and there's a lot of work to expand its financial resources to, for emergency lending and reforming the IMF to be more representative. So this all backs up the, the broad point that I think the, the edited volume that uh, Mike and Bates um, um, are announcing today, uh, that the region is not, that the, the global regimes still seem to be sort of um, anchoring uh, the economic framework in the region, despite the, the fact that there are these new regional mechanisms that are becoming more important and more influential. Uh, it's not, the Asia is not drifting away to institutionalizing Asian exceptionalism in Mike's words. Uh, thanks, Amy. We're going to uh, uh, take your questions uh, or comments. I mean, we um, uh, uh, interpreted this uh, data, um, came to some conclusions, um, and people may have different takes. Uh, then we'll stop uh, uh, after 20, 30 minutes, and we're going to do a uh, uh, is it out back, Kyoto? We're going to have uh, copies of our book, which uh, and copies of this, which is free, copies of our book, which is discounted. <laughs> um, if you want us to sign either one, we're happy to, um, uh, and we'll, we'll leave time for that. So um, the floor is open uh, for questions or comments or observations. Um, yeah, Jim. Hi, Jim Fristup from the Institute for National Strategic Studies. Mike, I just wanted to comment 
on your observation of the Japan-Korea relationship or the Korea perception of Japan. About three years ago, I did, I spent about 10 days in, in Seoul, interviewed uh, parliamentarians, members of the National Assembly. I did about 65 interviews. And this was just after Shimane Prefecture issued one of its periodic statements that Takashima really was Japanese uh, territory. Um, and I asked the question, looking out 2025 to 2025, what's your greatest threat perception and the greatest security concern in the region? And to a man, the issue, the answer was China. Nobody said Japan. And to me, this, I was really surprised to see this, just like you were in the survey. So I think there is a lot of room for developments, at least at the upper level between Japan and Korea, to really uh, extend cooperation. Jimmy must have been talking to the same people. I was just looking at the specific data here uh, on the question of greatest threat to peace and stability in 10 years. We, Mike mentioned that China clearly comes out number one. But guess of all the countries surveyed who saw China as the biggest threat of all those was, was, was Korea. So that, that definitely confirms, I think, your, your point. I also think that um, uh, on this question, uh, remember, we're uh, surveying uh, essentially internationalists. Um, and strategic thinkers. Um, I, I suspect if we had done a popular poll, we thought about that, but then we couldn't picture the taxi drivers in Osaka answering questions about the ASEAN plus three. Um, so we did elites. But I think if we had done a popular poll, we would have found a, found a bit of a disconnect uh, between elites and the public in Korea, although opinion polls in Korea do show public opinion polls, China tops everyone else as, as the threat. The degree would have been perhaps a bit, perhaps a bit less. Yeah, go ahead. Was that, Jim? Yeah, I did a, a roundtable with the National Assembly, uh, bipartisan National Assembly uh, Foreign Affairs Committee, and had a similar response. And Gordon and others probably get it every week. <laughs> uh, thanks, Mike. You um, mentioned a couple times in your presentation another poll that has was recently done by the Chicago Council on Global Affairs, of which I was involved, um, that surveyed six countries in the region. Um, not as comprehensive as yours, but it's very interesting to look at your findings and think about theirs. Um, the, I would just plug the, the full and final report of that Chicago Council survey is at the printers right now and will be out in a fortnight's time or so. The preliminary version was published last summer, but the fuller, you know, 40, 50 page will be out soon. But what you have to say about Thailand really resonates with the Chicago Council's findings too. We found a real, or they found a real disparity in perceptions of the United States between Northeast Asia and the two Southeast Asian countries that we surveyed, namely Vietnam and Indonesia. So you now bring Thailand into that picture and uh, suggest to me we've got, as you say, some real work to do, not just in Thailand but in ASEAN more broadly, which kind of confuses me a little bit because my impression was that the second Bush administration really put a lot more effort into ASEAN and that our image had in fact improved and there were sort of views of the U.S. engagement post-tsunami, perhaps, um, were much improved. But uh, your data and the Chicago Council data suggests maybe something different. So let me turn that observation into a question. You suggest that we should join the East Asian Summit, and therefore I suppose you mean sign the Treaty of Amity and Cooperation in order to do so. Um, would that be enough to turn around the perception of the United States and Southeast Asia, or what other work do you think needs to be done on U.S. ASEAN uh, relations? Um, th thank you. Uh, uh, by the way, um, the Chicago Council survey on soft power in Asia is our first or second footnote. Um, and when we briefed uh, policy planning and Secretary Clinton, we said if there's any other poll you look at, it's that one. <laughs> uh, it's very interesting. Uh, it, uh, I think it reinforces a lot of these findings. Uh, it's, it's a popular survey. It asks about soft power or influence, and uh, the U.S. comes out uh, number one in soft power, broadly uh, uh, rated, followed by Japan, interestingly, and then China. Um, uh, I think that, uh, you know, we went around and around trying to figure out this Thailand issue. Um, the first thing I should say is we don't actually recommend joining the East Asia Summit. We, what we say is the U.S. Should, should, should actively engage in a dialogue about this broader concept of an East Asia community. The East Asia Summit comes down to a, uh, my White House NSC staffer hat on, comes down to a rather boring but incredibly important issue of presidential scheduling. You know, can the president do two summits in Asia and that kind of, or do we combine it with APEC? There's some sort of mechanical questions. 
but, but as a general rule, uh, I think we, 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 we felt that we should be engaged actively and not – senior officials in the last few years have said that we don't like it. And I think it's – our conclusion it's a mistake to somehow portray this East Asia community idea or the East Asia summit as somehow not in U.S. interests, um, certainly based on our findings. Whether or not President Obama goes or Vice President Biden goes is something they'll have to figure out. Um, uh, at a minimum, I think pretty much everyone in this room would probably agree we should sign the TAC, the Treaty of Amity and Cooperation. I think there's a very good chance that'll happen. The Bush administration was poised to do it and couldn't for a variety of reasons. On Thailand, I'm not sure how much of this will affect Thai views of the U.S. And we had Al Laporta and other experts uh, on Southeast Asia, and we went around and around on this and, and also read some of the commentary by the Thai respondents. I think our problem is that the toxin supporters are mad at us because of the coup. And the anti-toxin people are mad at us because we weren't more supportive of the coup. So it, we're in a period, perhaps, where, um, where we, uh, we've, we've angered both sides of the Thai political debate by being neither fish nor fowl, neither, you know, perhaps it would have been better to have completely, you know, taken one side or the other. Um, uh, the other thing is, um, the, the flip side of that is, in terms of threat perception, the, the Thai elite are much less worried about China than just than most of the rest of the region. So, uh, and therefore, the indispensability of the U.S. becomes less of a factor. But it's a treaty ally. Um, at one point, we had a free trade agreement going. Um, we really felt that this is a relationship that, that needs special uh, attention. Did you want to? David Hitchcock. I should say, by the way, David Hitchcock did a, did a, 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 a similar project here at CSIS 15 years ago, 20 years ago. Anyway. Um, looking at elite views of Asian values that was one of the sort of inspirations for this project. Well, there were two, two – thank you. <laughs> um, that's a great promotion, but I don't think the, the two reports are available anywhere, even at CSIS. But in any case, uh, only on that one subject, the 96 study uh, of uh, seven countries uh, showed on your good government, free elections, and human rights – uh, that included courts, uh, the way it was phrased. Uh, Northeast Asia, that's Japan and Korea and China, came out quite high. China was surprisingly high, even then, this was in 96. Uh, what, uh, they came out higher than all of Southeast Asia, that is to say Malaysia, Singapore, uh, Indonesia, except Thailand, and Thailand was up there uh, with Northeast Asia on the free institutions, uh, which uh, is, I think you're right about Thailand today. I guess the main comment I have listening to this and uh, recalling uh, reports I wrote for CSIS, one in 88 on regional uh, security cooperation, that's 20 years, is how little things have changed. Uh, we, were, we were over optimistic. Uh, uh, even after interviewing all these people on that subject, particularly on things like piracy or uh, illegal immigration or smuggling, even those uh, uh, moved ahead very slowly over the years. But anyhow, uh, that's my main observation. If, if you think I've, I've concluded incorrectly from your talk, please uh, correct me. And finally, uh, if you ask the European countries uh, to evaluate their bilateral relations with the U.S., let's say, versus their regional cooperation for the similar goals, I don't know how much difference there would be. In other words, are we really dealing with a, a bilateral versus regional anywhere? Just say just a couple comments on the first point. Uh, it was interesting when we asked specifically uh, confidence in domestic institutions, as, and then we were trying to get a, a nice comparison to confidence to uh, regional institutions for delivering certain public goods. Um, if I recall correctly, yeah, the Indonesians and the Japanese uh, had real trouble with their, um, with their domestic institutions, but, but the Chinese had much higher, much higher confidence in, the, in their ability of their domestic institutions to deal with things like you know, the police, and the courts, um, and the health system, the domestic health system, and the like. I found that I found that somewhat interesting. You want you want me to say something about the 
about the European perspective on all of this? Yeah, I think the question was whether we'd find similar things in Europe or not. Uh, I'm not a real specialist on the, on the developments of some of these in Europe, but I, I think that broadly speaking, um, there are a lot of pressures coming to bear on um, certain activities of, of, of the European Union. And, and, and the, the, the biggest problems, I think, that they're going to have going forward is externalizing the European sort of normative approach to the world and doing it in a way that uh, is shared commonly across, uh, across, the, 20, across the 27. Um, developing internal uh, norms or common approaches to what we might call domestic challenges within the EU, I think they're going to have a great deal more success with that. And, and, they, and I think they, they've demonstrated, for example, through the success of the Euro, just as one example, that, that this, is a, this seems to be more widely accepted. Where they have the biggest problem is developing common defense and security policy, the use of EU forces abroad. And that's very controversial. Uh, it's done on a very, very limited scale, and um, it's, it's, it remains highly, highly sensitive. But I'm probably beginning to wade into some pretty uh, deep water to say anything beyond that. I think, um, David, some of the things that would be different from the 88 survey or even the 96 survey would be in India uh, and, in certainly, or, and the Indians' view of uh, East Asia in their own uh, strategic uh, world role. Uh, Indonesia, of course, has democratized. Uh, I think uh, I, I, I'm not sure how many surveys or questions you did in Indonesia. My guess would be in 88 or 96 there would have been a lot more defensiveness uh, about um, elections and things like that. Um, and then, of course, the expectation of Chinese power. Uh, today is probably quite different. We had a lot of questions. Uh, Opinion Dynamics Corporation, and they're the professional pollsters, um, helped us create questions that we could use to do even more cross-reverencing. So we asked a lot of questions, as Bates suggested, about how people view their effectiveness of their domestic institutions. And we thought we'd find some correlations, uh, but it was far too complex. So they're there if people are interested, um, and especially if you're interested in specific countries. <laughs> um, this is a cross-country uh, regional uh, survey. But if you want to, I mean, uh, and uh, uh, for example, on how, the question, how effective are your police and how effective are your military? Uh, the U.S., Australia, China, and Singapore had much more in common than anyone else. You know, Americans, Singaporeans, Australians, and Chinese think they're police. It wasn't a moral question. It was how effective are they? <laughs> and uh, on the military and the police, we, we uh, four countries had very high rankings. And what we found in, in the rest of the respondents was very low. So it was very hard for us to, on a region-wide analytical basis, to draw, connect the dots. But if you're interested in specific countries' um, attitudes, it, it's actually quite fascinating when you start peeling them open. Australia um, uh, was an outlier um, on the question of uh, how important is elections, too. We were very struck that on, on the elections, the lowest um, numbers, you know, were uh, Singapore, uh, China, and Australia. And I, and I still look forward to an explanation why, um, why that is. So there are a couple of things that are sort of outliers. Um, you do find that countries that have the most robust international strategies, uh, you know, frankly, Australia, China, Singapore, those kind of countries, they tend to have the highest confidence in their militaries and their police. Um, so there's some of these things that if you look on a country-by-country -country basis, they're kind of interesting and useful. We just didn't know how to connect the dots on the broader regional questions in a short report. Hi, Mark Mannion with the Congressional Research Service. A couple of questions about the, the, how you designed the, the survey. Uh, first, did you consider including Malaysia or Vietnam? in it, uh, and why did you, if so, why did you decide to drop them? And then secondly, how did you uh, make a concerted effort in choosing the elites not to just pick, uh, you know, the usual sort of pro-Western biased uh, uh, elites there and in here, the usual sort of Asianists uh, in, in D.C. and the United States? You should follow up, too. Um, well, the first question, I think, Obviously, we're, we're limited in some, some ways by time uh, and, and numbers and trying to make sure that we're uh, as concise as we can be. Uh, we, I remember we did have a, a pretty good debate uh, about Vietnam. Uh, we had a pretty good debate about Malaysia as well. Um, I think uh, maybe on the Vietnamese side, well, we just didn't feel confident that we were, would be able to generate uh, a list of – because we, one of our standards was to come up with a list of 150 names to begin. 
And I think we didn't have the confidence, at least in the case of Vietnam, that we would be able to do that. That's probably just a failing on our own, on our own part of being unable to do that. Um, I think, you know, methodologically, what I thought was the was the biggest challenge we faced of all was even with a list of 150. Um, unfortunately, in some countries, you, you ended up having a very, very low response rate. Just quite surprising. Um, maybe because it's, it was too long. Maybe it was I don't know. Yeah, I signed the letter, and uh, that's why they didn't want to respond. Um, but no, I think I don't think it was any. I don't think it was really a conscious sort of. Uh, political decision, if that's the right word. It was really came more down to practicalities. We, um, uh, we ran out of money. That's the main reason we didn't. <laughs> we didn't we, and uh, Asahi Shimbun and Jung Ang Ilbo in Korea, um, we used their polling arms to, to cover Japan and Korea, which are two expensive countries to do polling in. And ODC had language capabilities. Uh, they, I mean, most of the time they're polling and surveying for um, corporations, and uh, they're not doing policy questions. But they do have um, uh, centers in, in, in almost every country in the world they can turn to to do polling in those languages. So we tried to, uh, we were very conscious of the danger we would just get our friends entering the survey. So we tried to uh, account for that or take care of it in two ways. One was we asked our um, uh, expert panel to really scrub the list and make sure we were getting the broadest range of views possible. Um, and uh, uh, recognizing that we were going to think tanks and universities and places that are going to be uh, we're, we were looking for people who would be influential and be thinking about these issues. By definition, they're going to tend to be internationalists in those countries. Um, and we recognized that, but we wanted to make sure that we had plenty of contrarians and, 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 and we got them. Um, and the other way was to use the language uh, so that we didn't skew it to English speakers in countries uh, uh, where perhaps people who have a somewhat less positive view of the U.S. might not speak English, might not have studied here. So we did it in... Um, in the, in the languages of the countries. But uh, it's not, um, it's not uh, you know, we were trying to control for these variables, but it's going to be subjective at some level. That's why we uh, are presenting this as a, you know, it's, 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 a, it's a considerable step beyond um, the normal methodology, which is interviewing people, you know, a dozen people in each country on a trip. We tried to structure the questions so we could compare numbers and so forth. We think we have pretty rigorous methodology, but, uh, but we've portrayed it as something as an interim step. More can be, can be done based on the findings. Thank you very much for a very interesting presentation. My name is Atsushi Yamakoshi from Kedan and USA. I have a question about the role of APEC. Uh, as you know, Japan will host the meetings next year, and the uh, US will host the meeting next, next year. And I think it's a very good, uh, great challenge for Japan, first of all. But uh, it will be a very uh, important opportunity for Japan, US cooperation and APEC activities. So. From your study this time, could, can you draw some uh, strategic uh, implications or policy recommendation toward the EPIC activities? Thank you. Well, um, uh, Australia and the US were most enthusiastic about APEC um, and FTAP, the free trade area of the Asia Pacific. Uh, Japan was. Um, uh, a bit lower down. Um, and um, so I, I think as a broad uh, challenge for the incoming administration, um, we need to uh, think of ways to get Japan as the host of APEC excited <laughs> and focused. Um, the reality is uh, for the past eight years, President Bush has gone to every single APEC, he hasn't missed any. Um, and the U.S. has been um, active on the agenda to the point where people said you're too active and we backed off a bit. Um, we're sort of damned if we do and damned if we don't. Um, we need uh, uh, help from Australia and Japan, the, the two countries that really launched APEC, um, to start thinking creatively about the agenda. Our survey um, highlighted energy as a very promising area. So I, I think energy is one area APEC should look at. Um, but also um, uh, the question about how to strengthen um, trade liberalization and integration. Um, showed that bilateral FTAs are important. And I think if the, I, you know, those of us who follow the U.S.-Korea chorus FTA know it's probably going to be a year or two at best before it gets back on track. But the reality is 
if the U.S. doesn't have um, a trade liberalization agenda um, on a bilateral scale, uh, we're not going to have as much credibility um, on uh, the multilateral level. Um, and then for Japan, I think um, uh, the very low uh, expectation of WTO was a bit disappointing. Um, I, I would hope there'd be more support for agricultural liberalization in Japan, which would which would help on the WTO front. The Indians' wild enthusiasm for WTO may be more defensive than offensive, maybe more a recognition of how useful it is <laughs> to stop trade liberalization that India doesn't like. I don't know. But, um, but it was a bit disappointing to see the very low expectations in Japan for um, bilateral, multilateral, and even regional trade liberalization. Yeah, the, um, I mean, you take a look at the specific figures for um, seeing APEC as a vehicle for promoting economic integration and trade liberalization in the region, India scores almost zero uh, in its support uh, for that body. Um, obviously much more strong for the WTO, but I, I want to just, this is a little bit more anecdotal than based on the surveys, but um, uh, drawing from the conversations we had in St. Michael's and some of the back, some back and forth we had with the, especially the regional uh, experts who came, uh, I, what I mean to say is the Asian uh, analysts who came to that meeting, there was a this was, you know, almost three years ago now, but there was a, there was a, I think, a skepticism about this notion of trans-Pacific, right, Asia-Pacific, which is what the U.S. Uh, side and others uh, were, were so strongly promoting, uh, and, and, a, and a, I think at that time at least a greater enthusiasm for trying to build something that they would define as more, uh, uh, you know, within the region itself and not reaching out across uh, the Pacific to Chile or the United States or, or others, that could explain in part uh, some of the, ref the, the low scores that APEC gets among regional elites. And I agree with Mike very much, also somewhat anecdotally from, this, from, the, from those conversations a year or two ago, um, broaden the agenda. I mean, if this is just going to be about uh, trade liberalization, uh, there was going to be a lot more skepticism in the region to the degree the agenda can be pushed out into certain other areas where we have seen success, right? discussions about energy, even discussions about uh, counterterrorism and other questions. Uh, maybe that's a, a somewhat more uh, fruitful avenue uh, that APEC can try to pursue that would be reflective then of some of the interests within the region. I mean, I think this is a, a potentially very valuable opportunity over the next three years to reinvigorate the economic side of APEC, which has been somewhat lackluster um, over the past decade or so. Um, but with the emerging interest in FTAs and the very productive work that APEC is beginning to do in looking at FTAs, coming up with model mes measures, um, thinking of ways to potentially coordinate or harmonize FTAs down the road, and the emerging, uh, well, the potential pathway that has been opened up by the United States joining the, the Trans-Pacific Partnership negotiations with now eight countries, although I'm not sure whether Vietnam is in or out. That seems to go back and forth. But now we have the original P4, which is Singapore, Chile, New Zealand, and uh, Brunei. Um, and the United States has come on board. Australia and Peru have also come on board, and potentially Vietnam. Um, eight countries that are going to sit down and talk about a very comprehensive um, free trade agreement. This might be difficult to link into the APEC agenda over the next few years, but if we can make progress on those kinds of negotiations uh, over the next couple of years, it could be linked to APEC as a pathfinder initiative. And it certainly would, to get to Mike's point about credibility of the, of the United States being able to engage um, in, in uh, trade negotiations. Um, in addition to course, I would put TPP on the table as uh, a very important mechanism to get the focus in, in trans-Pacific relations back on uh, trade agreements and economic integration. Two other quick points on APEC um, uh, before we bury it. I mean, uh, first of all, the, the hosts are Singap Singapore, Japan, U.S. You, you, you really um, – those are three strong champions of trans-Pacific trade. So, you have, so we're, we're blessed with, uh, with, for those of us who care about trans-Pacific trade, we have, we have three perfect hosts. Um, second thing is, if you look at the surveys, um, you'll see 
APEC um, does pretty well. I mean, it's, it's in competition with ASEAN plus three, but it's not overwhelmed by ASEAN plus three. Um, and there's no reason why we can't have um, a kind of healthy, competitive trade liberalization process. Um, um, the important thing for the U.S., I think, is to keep APEC vibrant, alive, and an important um, aspect of trade liberalization and integration. Uh, and if we don't do that, then these numbers in a couple of years will start shifting more to ASEAN plus three, which is disadvantageous for us, Australia, Japan, and others. So we haven't lost this. We're not even losing it um, to other regional trade liberalization efforts. But, you know, there's a competition here. And I think we have to be on our game. And I'm personally worried that waiting two years on some of these things could hurt. But Amy's pointed out other things we can do in the interim to keep, our, uh, keep ourselves in the game. Uh, I think Ellen was next. Thanks, Ellen, for us. Just to add another nuance to your already complex picture, um, I, I think that you should look at FTAs in at least two ways. One is sort of how trade policy people look at it, and there's a group like Singapore and the U.S., Chile, that really want to go beyond WTO disciplines and WTO coverage, or sort of WTO plus. Then there's a whole other group of countries that really see these things, first of all, as, as political signals, friendly intentions, but also as ways of protecting their own economies from what they perceive as unduly rapid globalization. I mean, these, some of these bilaterals are full of holes um, and would not pass a WTO credibility test, nor have, are they even likely to meet the standards of Article 24, uh, which is not to dismiss them uh, at all. Um, there are, there's constant talk of some sort of uh, minimum standards or har har harmonizing the terms, and, and I do see a role for APEC in, in that, but all I'm saying is really there's a huge political and even security element in the negotiation of these agreements. They're preferential agreements. They're not free trade agreements. Hi, I'm Dave Sharma from the Australian Embassy. Um, thanks, Alec. I found all the, your study and the findings fascinating. I just had a question about the shape of new regional institutions. I mean, there's obviously broad support for the idea of an East Asian community, but the priorities that people identify um, promoting confidence building, preventing interstate conflict, promoting regional economic and trade integration. There seems to be, in the, I mean, from your survey at least, the view is that the existing regional mechanisms, at least those that include Australia and the United States, don't particularly meet those needs well. Um, APEC scores a little better on that front, but the ASEAN Regional Forum, which would be the one you'd identify as the natural security body, doesn't seem to meet those needs. Now, is, I mean, in terms of sort of policy prescriptions, is the solution to make existing institutions work better? Is the solution to devise new institutions? Um, or is it the solution to run a regional agenda more through global institutions that already have quite high stocks in the region? Um, you mentioned briefly, Mike, this idea of an Asia-Pacific community that our Prime Minister Kevin Rudd floated um, back in July last year. Just to give that a bit of context, I mean, this is, these are issues that we're grappling with as Australia. And Whilst we use this term Asia-Pacific community, we don't necessarily have a particular institution in mind. It's about finding solutions to problems. So it's about you know, having existing or new regional institutions work in a way that better meet regional, identified regional needs like um, preventing interstate, com interstate conflict, uh, promoting confidence, those sorts of things. Thanks. For two minutes. Um, well, I think you're, you're quite right to point to the, to the fact that um, what we see and I think we, we, we generated this in the book, and the survey tells us too, there's a great deal of ferment and uncertainty right now. And, and that, I mean, my personal view on this, we don't say this explicitly in the report, my personal view on this is that uh, that's okay. Uh, in fact, um, and we ought to be a part of it. That would be a U.S.-based recommendation as much as, as we can um, because we're at a very formative period here. Um, and uh, I'm, com well, I'm relatively confident that something can emerge uh, that is more structured and more formal and, and can deliver on certain public goods, uh, you know, in, in, in the near to medium term, hopefully 10 or 15 years. So we ought to be in on that now. Uh, so the fact that there's ferment and uncertainty and, and uh, proliferation of new organizations, in my view, is not necessarily a bad thing. Building new, yet new institutions, um, well, uh, maybe in some respects. I mean, I think we, we found both in, in, in some places in the survey but I think more importantly from the discussions around the book, uh, a, a, an openness to the so-called ad hoc uh, arrangement approach, 
um, things represented like by PSI or by um, the uh, six-party talks, um, et cetera, that there is, even in a, you know, a place like China, um, a growing appreciation uh, for the role that they can play. And maybe through the demonstration of effectiveness through those sort of ad hoc arrangements of like-minded states, that can lend some greater confidence to the broader, more form formal uh, institutions. So I, I, that's the way I'd come out on this. But uh, um, I've heard senior folks going into the administration musing about whether they could rationalize uh, this uh, architecture, um, combining somehow APEC, AES, and all the rest of it. Um, I don't think it's worth the effort. I think you'd expend an enormous amount of time and capital. There's a reason why there's this proliferation, and that's that, you know, this is a, a, an array of countries with different institutional needs and uh, hopes and expectations and fears, um, and the rationalization wouldn't be worth it, in my view. Um, and so I think Bates is right. We need to be engaged everywhere in every way we can. Um, one of our conclusions in the book, it's a bit more of a hypothesis, uh, is um, that uh, uh, in contrast to the EU, where the European Coal and Steel Union was the sort of seed that um, created a path dependency that basically grew into the tree that was the EU, we don't see that seed in Asia. We don't, see, you know, and in many ways, the most effective institutions in Asia are, are products of discontinuity or crises, whether it's the six party talks. Um, or even the Chiang Mai Initiative. They kind of grow out of a sudden recognition that existing patterns of cooperation or institutions are not sufficient. What that suggests to me is the old um, cliche about the Chinese characters for crisis, kiki, or, uh, you know, that it's crisis and opportunity that as, as the U.S. did in response to the tsunami crisis with Australia and Japan and India, or um, in the six-party talks, we ought to be ready to build patterns of cooperation quickly Start with our allies, but do it with China or whoever we can, and 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 and, and sort of seize on these crises, um, and turn them into opportunities to really build cooperation. That's going to be as important as you know any effort to rationalize or combine these institutions. And I agree with Bates that the ad hoc sort of sub-regional aspect has a lot of understanding and things like the TSD, U.S. Japan Australia Trilateral Security Dialogue, uh, comparable ideas with Korea. Um, discussions of U.S., Japan, China, uh, although that's sensitive in Korea right now. But these kind of smaller arrangements are very productive in, 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 in sort of bringing countries closer together. Um, if I were in the State Department, and since I back John McCain, I'm not, <laughs> um, <laughs> uh, I would certainly make the case to the Secretary or the Deputy Secretary that when you go to ARF, it may be a little bit boring, but what a great opportunity to pull together a lunch with Japan and Australia, a dinner with uh, China and Korea, you know, in various combinations, work these issues. Uh, you get a lot more done in these smaller ad hoc arrangements. I think everyone finds that. Um, so uh, I think we'll take one more question, and then we're going to take a break. So all the way in the back. Uh, Shao from Chinese Embassy. Uh, I'm a little hesitant uh, always about the results of the polls because last year, this time, every poll seems to suggest that Hillary Clinton will be your next president of the United States. But now she's going on her first visit to, uh, to Asian countries as the first Secretary of State. Uh, I just want to know uh, in your dinner last week with uh, uh, Secretary Clinton, uh, whether does she agree with the findings of your poll, and which one does she agree to? For instance, in your, there seems to be a little paradox here. Well, the, your poll suggests that uh, China comes after the United States as the second in terms of the contributing to pe peace and stability in Asia, but also the first, the biggest threat to peace and security in Asia. So I don't know uh, how do you reconcile it. As, as well as your suggestion, you seems to advocate for stronger relations between China and the United States. If judging by your polls, results, it seems as if you should have a second part, that is, there should be a, also a hedging policy towards China's threat. Uh, how, what's your explanation to that? I was invited to uh, brief Secretary Clinton as uh, I was the only, uh, was like the old Sesame Street song, one of these things is not like the other. <laughs> uh, I was the only person that worked on the other guy's campaign. Um, but uh, she was very interested in continuity and, and, and uh, some of the successes in the Bush administration, and basically she agreed with everything I said. Um, and, um, 
you know, what you, what you raise about uh, hedging strategy, we didn't ask specifically about that. But I think if you look at the surveys, uh, and especially the results in Japan, Korea, Australia, uh, some U.S. allies, there, I think it's a reasonable assumption that these countries are hedging uh, about the rise of China, and they're relying an awful lot on the U.S. alliance um, to do so. We didn't ask that, but that's what I would, how I would read the polls. Um, but uh, you made an important point. China was, came in second in terms of what country can contribute to peace and stability. I mean, it was well below the U.S., and, 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 and in terms of a, a, a potential threat, China was way ahead of the U.S., but there was a pretty good amount of support or expectation that China could play a positive role. And so I don't know if you're sending a cable back to Beijing, but that would be my recommendation, that, that uh, there is worry about China's rise, but there's also at some level a hope and expectation that China can play a positive role. And, 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 and also not a whole lot of disagreement between American and Chinese experts about how this ought to work. So a real opportunity for a dialogue and building cooperation in regional architecture that's reassuring for the whole, whole region. Because we also came in uh, uh, third in terms of threats to the region. So we might be able to help each other out. Uh, well, please join me in thanking me uh, and Bates. Um, <laughs> uh, we'll be out back if you want to buy the books. Thanks very much.